Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. The Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. We are rejoined fresh out of the Senior Bowl, Mr. Ryan Fowler of the Draft Network. Thank you so much for blessing us this evening on this Monday evening, Ryan. Tonight's episode is called Fowler's Findings. So I want to kind of talk to you about this Senior Bowl. And our first position I want to kind of go into is left tackle. Was there anybody at left tackle at the Senior Bowl that really stood out to you? Yeah, uh, going down there, first off, I always appreciate you guys having me on. But, you know, local guy, Jalen Duncan. Um, I was so interested to see him because watching his tape, you turn on the Ohio State tape against Zach Harrison, rough day for Jalen Duncan. And he dominated lower level competition. I wanted to see how he produced against the best draft eligible seniors in the country. And I thought he was absolutely fantastic. There's not a single tackle in this class. Maybe Broderick Jones from Georgia that is athletic as Jalen is at 298 pounds. He moves like a tight end. Absolutely fantastic this week in the run game and pass pro. I thought he was dominant at times. And that's exactly what I wanted to see. And a guy that went to St. Francis Went to Maryland. I talked to him multiple times this week about how he's a big Wizards fan, loves Bradley Beal. Why not make that guy a burgundy and gold foundational guy at left tackle, right tackle potentially? You know, who remains to be seen what Washington does at either side. But Jalen Duncan, for me, as far as the tackle spot, uh, was absolutely fantastic this week. You know, talk to me about Dewan Jones, because we talked to Logan Paulson on Thursday, and he talked about how he was out with an injury after his first day, but it was like, it was kind of one of those like, quote unquote things. So what happened with Dewan Jones? Did he really but, impress all that much? By the way, real fast, Dewan Jones wingspan would be the longest, I think, in NFL history when he comes out. It's like seven foot five or something crazy yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, he's a huge human being. Um absolutely massive. But that whole day after day one concussion, no, that's that's an that's an agent thing there. He, all he needed mm-hmm. to, all he needed to show. But I'm I'm really glad that he stayed to do interviews. Um, he was there the rest of the day hyping up teammates and stuff, but he was absolutely dominant. That's exactly what I wanted to see and everybody else wanted to see from him. Being that big, I hate when big guys play small, and we love when small guys play big. You're that big, you better play like it. You don't be soft, and he wasn't soft on day one. Absolutely dominant. Just throwing dudes in the dirt. It didn't matter what it was, and working in the run, working in pass pro, guys trying to work the outside or inside. He's got those long arms. Once he gets his hands on you, it's game over. Maybe laterally he may have some issues with quicker, smaller guys, that 245, 55 pound hybrid rushers that we see, some of those DPRs that teams have. Um, but absolutely, I mean, overall, Dewan Jones, as big as he is, I, I how do you not take him on day one? I think the NFL is going to fall in love with him even more. Paris Johnson's got all the attention in Ohio State, but but Dewan Jones is, is right up there with him. He was absolutely fantastic as well. Yeah, I've heard a, a, I read a couple of reports saying that he pretty much cemented himself just from yeah. that one day, his measurements just as a first round pick. And that's incredible, too, because you're right. Uh, everybody wants to talk about Paris Johnson. But another position in need is the tight end position. There's a lot of good tight ends there at the senior bowl. Who kind of caught your eye? I know Luke Musgrave was the big name. Who else out there? Yeah, Payne Durham, um, tight end for Purdue. My Such a sick name, too. <laughs> yeah, my expectations, fellows, were low on Payne heading into the week. Right. He's not going to blow anybody away from testing measurables when he goes to the combine he's not going to blow anybody away but just how he understands the position i mean understanding leverage understanding how to seal guys on his back you saw him in the game should have caught that touchdown from malik cunningham all week long seven on sevens one on ones i thought he did a really nice job over the middle of the field again another big body going into this process i thought he reminded me of charlie kohler guy that the ravens took out of iowa state i hated that comp to be honest, I hated it. So I was hoping for Payne to impress, and he did for me. Um, but I had to talk about Luke Musgrave. I mean, talking to him multiple times after practice, you can see the scar on his knee. Only played in two games this year. Talking to him, and I go, hey, Luke, you know, how, how, was the, how was the process so far? How are you feeling? He goes, yeah, I'm still trying to get my football legs under me. You look up at the big board, and they got the top speeds from the GPSs, and he's at the top, faster than your receivers, faster than your corners. Jesus. Yeah, I'm just getting my football legs under me at 255 pounds. Wow. Absolutely. God. So he's challenging for tight end one as of yeah. right now, to be, to be honest with you. Um, just absolutely fantastic as well. Luke Musgrave, um, another tight end I'm trying to think as far as guys that really stood out. I wasn't impressed by the Cameron lot twos of the world. Right. Will Mallory had a, a couple nice catches in the game. Um, but what have you seen from Zach Koontz? 
from Old Dominion. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, dude, he's a freak. Dude, highly touted, right? Penn yeah. State former commit. Um, I think he's one of those sleepers. I think yeah. on day three to come in and potentially be a guy like we saw with Armani Rogers and Curtis Hodges, right? For Washington this year. Surprise. I think he's going to be someone that could surprise later on day three. It's a, a local guy. Yeah. He's, he's like 6'8, isn't he? He's a big yes. dude. He's 6'8, yeah. 250. They say he runs a 4'5 a and has a 40 inch vertical at 6'8. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. And sticking with, um, I guess, commanders, position the needs, and guys at the senior bowl, what do the linebackers look like? Because I definitely think the commanders are going to be looking to add some linebacker depth this uh, upcoming offseason. Yeah, I loved what I saw from Aubrey Miller Jr. from Jackson State. Yeah. Small school kid, out of the SWAC, HBCU. I, I just loved it. You know, people are calling him OG. People are calling him Unk on the field. Is he going to move any needles with somebody as a starter, as a three down linebacker? No, he's a day three guy for me still, but the, he all over the place. And I just, I think there's something to be said about guys that are just good football players. We get so caught up in this process with tools and traits. Aubrey Miller, you watched that first play of the senior bowl, Evan Hole running back from Northwestern breaks 25 yard run, tries to break back inside. Aubrey Miller knocks his chin strap off, letting you know, Hey, I'm going to be here. And I'm rolling, roaming back 30 yards downfield. Just, Absolutely just physical. I just I, I like kind of those throwback style of linebackers. It's just physical presences in the middle of the field. I thought he played well. Cam Jones from Indiana, about 6'1, about 230 pounds. Liked what he had. Like I think he's more of a, I like guys at the linebacker position that are fillers, not just pluggers, guys that attack defense, attack gaps in the run. Um, Cam Jones showed me that a ton. Servassier Dennis is a kid from Pitt. Um, not fundamentally as long way to go in that aspect, especially in coverage, Tajay Spears. I'm sure that you guys saw that clip went viral in one-on-ones, uh, but he was <laughs> yeah. all, all over the field. Um, but another name, and I think it's a little bit of a sleeper. I know Kyle, you mentioned it earlier, but Marte Mapu is a linebacker from Sacramento state. He was at NFL PA. He came to the senior bowl late and had a couple of practices, didn't play in the game, but he's a hybrid that I think could play at every single level. Meaning by that is you can be exotic. And what you want to do with this kid. And it reminds me a lot of Talanoa Hafunga with the 40, mm. what he can do because he's built like a safety, but it, watching him in coverage and watching how physical he was not looking at the decal on his helmet because he's thinking Sacramento state uh, pushed him to the side. This kid could play ball. So Marte Mapu is, is a guy that I please bold and, and check some tape on. If you guys have the, uh, the avail availability, I know it's a busy time of year, check him out. Cause he can play ball. Now, Ryan, I know looking at your Twitter over the weekend, obviously you were in heaven there at the Senior Bowl. You were just writing your element, loving all your surroundings. You kind of uploaded a lot of uh, videos and pictures of DBs, of cornerbacks. Kind of give us your feel of the cornerbacks. Who impressed you in that breath? And the, Is there a lot of depth? In, not depth, I guess. Is this cornerback draft class, is it somewhere you could go in the middle rounds and get a really good guy like Tariq Woolen? Absolutely. I think Darius Rush, corner from South yes, Carolina, you know, he it. was – he was CB2 at Carolina this year, opposite yep. of Cam Smith. Former wide, wide receiver. receiver convert. Yes. 6'1", yeah. 33-inch arms, smooth. Technically, ways to go. Is he a CB1? No, I don't think he's even a high-level CB2 right now. Okay. So we look at Washington at 16. We've talked about the Joey Porters, the Cam Smiths, the Christian Gonzalez's of the world. But Darius was outstanding at the Senior Bowl. Julius Brents from Kansas State. When you look at a guy like Montez Sweat, and you see his arms go down to his knees, that's what Julius Brents is as a former transfer from Iowa. Mm -hmm. People talk about the Big 12 title game and how he kind of took his lumps against Quentin Johnston. I like guys at the in the cornerback's room, fellas, that are battle tested. I don't want someone, someone that's never picked on, understanding how to come back. I lost a rep. What do I do now? Just sit and sulk? No, I'm going to come back and win that next rep. Julius Brents wasn't picked on all week long. Seven on sevens, but one on ones, getting those reps where he's really getting tested on every single throw. His length. I want him to be a little bit more quicker with his feet and turning mm -hmm. his hips. But zone defenses with Jack Del Rio working downhill as a ball hawk in that length, we know that they like Benjamin St. Juice Lake. Yeah. That fits. So Darius Rush and Julius Brents, Jacorian Bennett from Maryland, super, super detail-oriented. Didn't flash a ton other than the pick that he had in the game, but super detail-oriented in special teams, let people know where they're supposed to be. Just very, very detail-oriented player that, for me, I think about him reaching that ceiling early in his career – being so detail oriented will allow him to do that. And it just yeah. got announced that Brian Flores has accepted the defensive coordinator job for the Vikings. So he's leaving Ooh. the Steelers going to Minnesota. Mm. Sorry, Reed. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. You should be apologizing more. You should apologize at least three, four times per episode, I think I would say. But uh, the <laughs> most important position. Now. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> the most important position in the NFL, of course, the quarterback position. I know not a lot of quarterbacks really 
stood out. This last year's was quarterback room was a lot better, I, I would say. But uh, somebody who really interests me, Tyson Baggin, Tyson Baggin, however you say it. Uh, he's somebody who could take a late round flyer on. What did you see from the quarterbacks? Absolutely. Late round flyer for, for Tyson Badgen. I think it was the best quarterback there. I was extremely oh, wow. disappointed. Yeah. And what I saw from the quarterbacks this week, it was Max Duggan. Okay. You know, Jake Hayner. I was, I, I think I've talked to you guys about, about Jake Hayner before, yeah. how I liked his game at Fresno state. Yeah. Now I'm not going to say a couple days, of the senior bowl, it completely sways my opinion, but if you're not hitting five yard checkdowns consistently in the NFL, you're not going to play. And right. I think in those neutral environments offers that, that gives you a good glimpse of those guys against faces that they're not used to. Um, so, but Tyson day three, watch him in the game. He's just extremely confident, extremely poised and coming from a lower level school and you're facing guys on the outside and the edge that can really get after the passer. The guys at down in mobile was extremely efficient and pressed the ball downfield a little bit. If he had to gave his guys some chances. I loved what I saw from Tyson Badgen, the guy that we were able to meet this week as well, who he was, um, was just really impressive, extremely cerebral. I always talk about winning between the years where you ever win with your arm and legs. He is that type of guy, and I think he will be a day three flyer for somebody to come in and, and compete for snaps. Yeah, I heard a lot of good things coming out of the practices during the week about um, him. So let's yeah. see where he goes in the draft. And jumping outside of the um, the senior bowl for a second, um, to, speaking of quarterbacks, this, this question just kind of popped in my head. I was on Twitter a little bit earlier, and I think it was Matt Miller um, put out his first mock draft. And they had the commanders taking Anthony Richardson out of Ugh. Florida Ugh. at number 16. I'm kind of like, mm, I wouldn't do that. But I just wanted to get your um, – what's your thoughts as Anthony Richardson as a prospect, and would you like that pick at 16 for the commanders? Yeah, electricity, right? It's just – it's what the NFL likes. Tools, traits, big, strong arm, can create with his legs, supposed to Got run it all. Four threes, yeah. all that stuff. Checks all the boxes. Um, but, you know, being an athlete doesn't mean you're a good football player. Uh, I'm not going to say he's not a good football player. I think he's got a lot of tools to work with. But right now, and the kid that you got in the building is someone that could be a potential steal down the road. I know we it's franchises, either you got your guy or you're looking for one. And there's only about five to seven teams that have their guy. Right. Um, at 16, uh, if they if they love the tools, if they love the traits in this offense, bottom line is they got to get an offensive coordinator that's able to mesh those skill sets all together in the first place. Um, but the whole Anthony Richardson thing, I mean, he's going to go somewhere. He's going to go high because of those tools and traits. Um, I think he's a little bit advanced as a passer than what we give him credit for, but there's just so much there to where you're going to have to wait maybe two, three years from to reach that ceiling. And I've told you guys before, I like Sam Howell a lot. I really do. And I, I think he's the guy moving forward for this offense. So at 16, I think there's more needs and try to reach on a quarterback again with tools. Yeah, yeah Ryan, thing, it, oops, my bad. Real fast, just on Anthony Richardson. Like, I know that we all talk about he's not there as a quarterback yet. He's not. But the, his natural ability, like watching his highlights, just go watch his highlights from this past season. When he's on and he makes plays, that dude makes some unreal things that nobody yeah. else can do. It's yeah. crazy. Very, yeah. very true. Now, to wrap this up, Ryan, I only have a couple more questions for you, but you kind of alluded to it, so I, got, I want to bring it there. The It's been speculated by Ian Rappaport and others that Eric Bieniemy is a destination in Washington. It's something to keep an eye out for. It's intriguing. Do you think that that is a far-fetched idea, that Eric Bieniemy would come here? Uh, I don't think it's far-fetched. I think if he were to come here, I think it's for an opportunity to be a head coach in the NFL. You know, we talk about him so long as far as being a byproduct of Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. If you know, he hears those things like those guys don't, you know, he hears those things and the success is there. I, I think he wants to come to a spot where he would have the autonomy to call plays. And I, if I'm an offensive coordinator, I look at Washington and I see the guys that we got in the building, it would intrigue me a little bit. Work with another young quarterback, a solidified top 10 receiver in Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, who the hell knows in the next two years or so, he might be up there as well. Got a great running back in the building, uh, improvements along the front five supposed to make this off season. You get Eric Bieniemy in the building and say you go 500 or end up below 500 again, there's an opportunity to be a head coach here in the next few years. And I think that's what he wants. And if he were to come to Washington, I think that'd be the opportunity that he looked for in the next few years. I totally wholeheartedly agree with you, Ryan. Now, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, the end, it's way too early to do predictions for the draft. But hypothetically speaking, let's say the draft were to be go in order based on your projections and rankings for the players. If Washington traded back to the late of the first round, what prospects or prospect would you be looking at circling and saying, go get him? Yeah, I think right now trading back means more picks, which means I can add corners later in the draft, round two, round three. I don't know what the situation is with um, Chase Roulier. I don't know. And for me, if we're at, let's just say 25, 26, John Michael Schmitz 
interior offensive lineman from Minnesota. He was arguably outside of Tank Dell, the receiver from Houston, was the most impressive prospect for me this week. There was not – he didn't move – In pass pro, no one was able to move him two, three inches off the spot in the run game. He's not going to be as athletic as a Tyler Linderbaum from Baltimore by any means. But this kid is super, super smart and cerebral, making pass protection calls two days into practice, a leader along the front five. That is a foundational add to your core of your offensive line for hopefully seven to ten years. And watching him work, it didn't matter if it was against a 280-pound Carl Brooks from Bowling Green or 320-pound Gerard Clark from Coastal Carolina. There's just no chance. His hands are too good. He understands leverage too well. His anchor, he sticks his cleats in the ground. You're not moving him. So I know we want corners. I know we want to tackle in that range. Also, Darnell Wright from, from Tennessee and Jalen Duncan from Maryland, as I mentioned earlier. But I, you win games in the trenches. We're so sexy with the receivers and running backs and quarterbacks in this league. Just like we was in the 1950s, you win games within the trenches. And a guy like John Michael Schmitz within the interior – Again, we'll see what happens with Chase Roulier, but I would not be surprised if he were to be the addition, considering just how attentive the Washington scouting staff was and Martin Mayhew was in those big boys up front this week. Yeah, absolutely. Wholeheartedly agree. Now to wrap this up, my last question for you. At the Senior Bowl, just on your opinion, I, you might have already said his name. I'm uh, Mistake me if I did. Who was the most impressive standout prospect from the Senior Bowl? Who increased their draft stock the most, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I talked about John Michael Schmitz, but he was already kind of a late right. round one guy. Um, I think it's Darius Rush from yeah. South Carolina. You know, he was yeah. someone that's kind of come on late again. Cam Smith's gotten all the attention at Carolina. I don't think he gets out of the early, the later portions of round two, early portions of round three. Wow. Just fantastic. Uh, again, technically, a little bit of ways to go. But this is a draft where you're looking just like on the receiver spot, where you're looking for wide receiver twos and threes corners you know there's there's cv ones at the top all the names for but you want to wait a little bit and add a position of need then you add a guy like darius rush if if kendall fuller is going to be back and if saint juice gets healthy hopefully Hmm. but you need guys in the building that will compete and darius rush just seeing him fits the script you watch him i just he impressed me every single day just how smooth he was how patient he was he was never out of sorts and when he was off a rep a little bit just consistently come back fine-tune his technique talk to the coaches and work on things there wasn't a single receiver with different skill sets there that was able to beat him consistently and i just i there's one guy it's darius rush that that rise a lot for me in this process i yeah, know that you're uh you, uh, you were high on position. darnell right already ryan but how did uh did he disappoint you at all no, I think he took his lumps, which I wanted to see because those okay. are the part of the learning process. Um, but you watch him in the game. He had a rep against Yaya Diaby, an edge rusher from Louisville, and just completely snatched his hands down within a second in the rep and just shows you the potential and the ceiling of this kid. Super smart, almost a little shy. You can tell how young he is um, at the position. But he doesn't play like it. No, he does not. I just, just watching him move his lower half. I always talk to you guys about footwork. That's where it starts for me always. A guy of that size that can move. He's very almost a little top heavy. It looks a little bit very kind of a little thin in the waist, like Kyle, um, but allows right. him to move and laterally <laughs> super thin can kick step, get out, counter outside rushers inside, puts that left hand up. I love Darnell, right? I hope he's yeah. there. I hope he's in the burgundy goal moving forward. Too, we'll yeah. see. Um, but he's also, he also rose as well. Would be really happy with him yeah. as always. And of course, I can't thank you enough for joining us on this Monday evening, Ryan. And obviously you host your own podcast, uh, Commanding the Huddle, obviously. So if you guys haven't already, go and check that out. Obviously, Ryan Fowler is one of the best people you can go to for the scouting info. Obviously, not, not much uh, goes without his, uh, obviously, his finger being put on it. Ryan, I can't thank you enough for joining us, brother. Hope you have a good evening. Yeah, appreciate it as always, guys. Talk to you soon. Appreciate it, Ryan. Again. So, yeah. Man, dude, I'm telling you, an encyclopedia, just I know knowledge. Who who yeah. better to have at the Senior Bowl than Ryan Fowler? Seriously, though, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, He's Logan so was good. obviously there. Logan knows a lot. As yeah, well. but Logan's also overrated. Okay, Logan doesn't guys, know all guys, that he leads on. That guys, he knows. we're not going to draft anyone good from the Senior Bowl because Ron wasn't there. So I don't, I don't know why oh, we're yeah, even talking he was about golfing. it. Golfing, you're right. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, dude, he had better was, things to do. He was golfing. You know, yeah, that yeah, was the right. craziest thing. But hey, you before know. we were joined by our next guest, we start answering these fantastic fan questions that were submitted into us let's do our prospect breakdown all right and uh, so reed i know you've been waiting for this uh, the draft is one of your obviously hobbies that you love to do for some weird random reason but we love you for it man so who's your prospect breakdown for tonight uh my prospect we heard about jacory and bennett uh, a little bit earlier um so my prospect is uh deontay banks the other cornerback from maryland the person who didn't get as much hype during the season but he's somebody who i, I think he'll 
probably be a day two pick. I mean, you just look at him. He's super athletic. He's a, uh, he's listed at six two two oh five. Of course, the combine, anytime you you see a player listed at a height before the combine, just subtract an inch from it. That means he's six one. Right. That happens every, <laughs> with every single player. It's so it's, it's ridiculous, but uh, he's got very, He's very athletic. First of all, let me just start. He's got a very athletic build. He's very athletic in general. He's fast. He can jump. Uh, he has a little bit of issues moving his hips, but he's somebody who he seemed to have gotten better each and every game. Jacorian Bennett, like I said, he got all the attention, but he was usually lined up on the best wide receiver, and he usually did a hell of a job. Deontay Banks, he's younger, uh, and he just has that bit. Like, you look at him, and you're like, that's an NFL cornerback. Yeah, that, I mean, 6'2". Like, that's yeah. the exact kind of height. Like, that's Benjamin St. Juice 6'2", height, right? 205. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's Saint exactly what you're looking for. Right. Yeah. Um, for me, I have two prospects. And the reason for that is because Ty Mac had sent us a question on Twitter earlier, and I misread it, and I, th I thought that I would use them for my uh, prospect breakdown. But I read the question wrong. But mm -hmm. anyway, the first prospect to look at is Eric Gray, the running back from Oklahoma. He's 5'10", 210 pounds. He is a senior. I think he was a, a transfer as well. But this is an aggressive, powerful runner, man. Many times that I see him being able to spin out of tackles, rushing through and then power runs, but also being a crucial aspect in the passing game. You saw him rip off some big runs, being able to be patient in a way, being able to move in and out of uh, the way of the linemen when things get clogged up to the line of scrimmage. Very impressed with his footwork, his agility, but also his straight line speed. There was a couple times where as soon as he got green grass, he was gone. But I'm very impressed with this kid because in the short yardage game, he runs very, like, physically, very aggressive. And so in those third and ones, Oklahoma shut and had no problem with calling his number, and he usually delivered in that aspect. So when I talk about getting a late-round running back, a, a late-round running back that can do all the things that you want, I think Eric Gray does notch that box. The other guy I'm going to highlight real quickly is Wanya Morris, the right tackle from Oklahoma. He is strictly... He, he is a guaranteed mauler in the run game. Fantastic run blocker. He's 6'6", 305 pounds, but he does lack in the pass blocking game. His footwork needs a lot of help. His hand placement seems to be off at times, gets beat inside, but he's got he's aggressive as well. He has a mean streak to him, and he's looking to throw guys on the ground, and he's a mauler in the run game, but obviously pass blocking is where he's going to need some help. But if you need somebody up front right away, this guy Morris, or Wanya Morris, to come in late rounds for you and be somebody you are excited about in the future. Just needs a little coaching up. But look, that's why we got um, uh, John Matsko here, who's very good at being able to do that. So those two guys, Eric Gray, the running back, and uh, Wanya Morris, the right tackle, both from <coughs> Oklahoma, very impressed with those two. Do you have anybody? I didn't know we were supposed to do a possible breakdown, so I don't even have anybody. It's all, it's all good. I did it's two okay. anyway. Kyle did two for you. It's okay. I did two for you. <laughs> don't do that, man. I don't was just talking, talking about Christ, uh, Christian voice. Gonzalez. It was Christian Gonzalez. Oh, I thought you were a fan of him. <laughs> I thought you were a big Christian Gonzalez fan. Now, this next question that we have, this is from Commander's Call on Twitter, who DM'd me this question. With the needs all over the O-line, what are your thoughts about drafting Minnesota's John Michael Smiths, either in a trade-down scenario or by moving up in the second round? Watching his, his film, he has elite movement skills at the snap and dominates the point of attack. I would like to hear what your thoughts are on his film and what he would bring to the line, Reed. Uh, yeah, John Michael Jingleheimer Schmitz is, first of all, the dude is a stud. You heard about it, but he just dominated at the Senior Bowl. Uh, and on top of that, everybody, I know, look, Chase Roulier is fantastic. Chase Roulier is really good when he's healthy. He hasn't been healthy in two years. And it's super frustrating because the best ability is availability. And if you can get a nice young stud up in there, kind of like Kyle does every weekend, gets a nice young stud over at his house, you know what I'm saying? And uh, to plug things up, I think you, you got yourself... <laughs> A nice cornerstone. But, yeah, I love the idea of trading back into the end of the first round and taking him. I really do. Yeah, I, I, I like him a lot. I watched him film before we started doing this. And I think Ryan Fowler did a great job of kind of explaining him because he's not a guy that you're going to watch the film and he's going to come on as very dominating. Like, he's not going to be throwing guys onto their backs. He's more so of being in the right position, blocking the right guy, and he doesn't get moved when he does it. So he has good mechanics, and he's very good with his hands of being able to control things. So it's not like you're looking for somebody that's going to come in and like a Brandon Sheriff. Like when Brandon Sheriff's film came out, he was looking to decapitate yeah. people. And that's not the, the thing you're going to get with John Michael Schmitz. You're going to get more of like the Chase Rouye type where he's going to do the things correctly. He's going to get everyone in position, a multi-year starter. I really do like uh, John Michael Schmitz. I just feel like we're going to get in position uh, kind of like I was with Pete Werner. 
last season where I thought that Pete Warner was like a third round grade on a guy and I thought that he could come in and start free right away and the Saints draft him in the second round I think John Michael Schmitz could be John Jingleheimer uh, Schmitz could be one <laughs> of those guys his parents did that on purpose right, right? <laughs> John Michael get, Schmitz, uh, I feel John like Michael. he's a guy that could get drafted in the high 20s just because out of need uh, for example and that's somebody you're going to miss out on so I would like to put a lot of stock into John Michael but I feel like his what he offers is highly coveted in the NFL and that is plug and play ability and so I think that he will be drafted um, higher than we estimate. Yeah, like you just said, plug and play ability, especially for this team, would be a uh, is definitely going to be like a, a top priority when it comes to whatever they pick in the first, second, or third round. Just like kind of last year when you got guys like Brian Robinson and whatnot <clears throat> get drafted in the first couple of rounds and were plug and play guys. Well, Robinson, you know, would have been a plug and play guy. Right. But um. Yeah. Yeah, I think the most like what most stands out is what uh, Ryan Fowler was talking about, how by day two he's out there making all the line calls. And obviously, if anyone knows, Chase Rui is a really smart player. He's the guy that was really helping the quarterbacks out, especially like the shuffles of quarterbacks, making the pre-snap calls, making all the pre-strap reads, making the job for the quarterback a lot easier. And I think obviously if you uh, draft a guy like that, he's going to bring leadership to the line. You got a young quarterback like Sam Howe. Um, only there's only going to help him with a, a guy up front that's snapping in the ball, that's making all the pre-snap reads for him, giving him like all the uh, the checks and whatnot, and as, as well for the other linemen. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, he would be a great asset if they drafted him to the team. Yeah, totally yeah. agree with you. Um, I wanted to talk about this because I completely forgot last Thursday because it was just so chaotic and everything that happened. But Bobby Bethard um, passed away at the age of 86. Um, he yeah. passed away on January 30th, obviously being a Hall of Fame executive. Built was had his hands in in everything that was built here in Washington and for the Lombardis and the team that was built here. Um, so I wanted to put pay my our respects to Bobby Bethard. And um, what do you think that his – I think the best draft, obviously, I think, what was it, the 82 draft? Was it Russ Grimm and all them in that draft class? Where he literally, and Mark May, just absolutely killed that draft class. I think he got four starters out of it. So a lot of respect to Bobby Beathard. It's unfortunate he passed away at 86, but obviously he lived a long and great life. Yeah, that's a long life for a, you know for an old man, 86 yeah. years. And let's go around the league real quick. Just some latest reporting. Jeremy Fowler reported that Lamar Jackson in Baltimore could be $100 million apart on guaranteed money for his contract. <laughs> Holy crap. Damn, Lamar's, <laughs> Lamar's turned into a real Florida boy. He's trying to get that bag. He's like, nope, nope <laughs> not, not giving y'all no breaks. I mean, I can understand it <clears throat> to an extent. You won an MVP award, but, man. Yeah, I understand that. But in, best, in this, no, in I'm this, just saying from his point of view, he was the best scrambling quarterback in NFL it, history. You're like, absolutely, he's... you're absolutely right. But the one aspect that I bring up is he did flex on the Ravens a little bit by sitting out the, yeah. the season, him oh, by yeah. saying, "Look, you got to take care of your boys." Well, look at the Ravens yeah. now. Okay, you want $100 million more guaranteed? Well, you didn't show up for us when we needed to, so why would I? Yeah. Are you going to do it in the future? Are you going to sit out again when we need you for the playoff run? But now that right. I paid you all this money, you're going to show up? And that yeah. is why sometimes being aggressive in the way Plus, that you act can hasn't been you. the same player since that MVP season. He's still good. Don't get us Lamar Jackson. I mean, he's a stud, the dude. Right. But Well, it's also yeah. kind of like once you set those numbers as an MVP, like right. if you're, you're going to match those numbers is. every right. year, like you're going to have a drop off. Like, right. But he's had some, like, look at but, look at his numbers this past year. Yeah, no, he's, he's been injured bad. a lot and injuries have been stacking up, but he's just not a good quarterback. <laughs> but if you also look at Baltimore okay. without him, I mean, <laughs> They're scoring a lot less points when he's not hey, on the field. Hey, so. you, say, you say look at Baltimore without him. I say they had a backup Pro Bowl quarterback, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and now we are joined by our next guest, Mr. Steve Lim from the Command This podcast. Thank you for joining there us, brother. How you doing? What's up, fellas? How you doing? Thanks for having me. No, we uh, really appreciate you taking your time out. Obviously, um, we, you had to leave work early, which I'm so sorry that you were for, oh. forced to do that. I know that you're really oh. blown. And <laughs> terrible, terrible. Doing terrible. That. Um, but we were just talking about Bobby Beathard and uh, his passing and also Lamar uh, Jackson contract uh, dispute. But if you want to talk about Bobby, uh, Bobby Beathard real quick. Yeah, he, he, I'm not sure what you guys already said, but man, talk about a true legend in, in Redskins history with, with that with that draft, you know, where he picked up, you know, Diddy or Jacoby as an undrafted free agent. You know, the, half the Hogs, Mark May, right. found Daryl Green later. I mean, the man was just a legend. And, and a lot of people say that um, – you know, Cashley kind of rode his coattails afterwards, but you know, it it's all good. Sorry to see him go, man. He's a true, true legend, Hall of Famer. Um, so we can hang our coattails on. But um, yeah, one of the best to do it in, in Washington for sure. 
And really it's crazy dude. too because Charlie Casserly looks like he's been dead for the last twenty years. <laughs> dude, <laughs> come on, <laughs> he looks like he was a Leave puppet. Charlie alone. What did Charlie do to you? Nothing. He's actually a cool guy. I didn't do anything. See, I'm just I'm just a guy that's picking players, man. That's all I'm doing. Yeah, so yeah. That's exactly how he talks. Players, so yeah. That's exactly how he talks. He's yeah. He's Please such a stereotypical when he's gangster. Charlie is probably the nicest guy in the world, and we're just sitting here just. There, see. Yeah, my Tommy gun. Just, see, where's my cigar at? I got a better drag draft pick. See. <laughs> Please stop. He's semi local still, I think. He is. Yeah, he probably yeah. sure is. He loves the area. Who does? He's a nice guy. But uh, Steve, I want to go to our fan questions. And the first one I want to ask you with this is from the Colonel. He asks, Do you see any scenario where the commanders move up in the draft? I just don't see it. I think they're pretty, you only really do that for a quarterback. I just don't see another piece that's that important to them at this juncture in time. So no, I, I don't see a scenario unless you get to somewhere we're at 16, maybe 10 and one of those top dogs, they're going to fall like, you know, CJ Stroud or which is not going to happen. So no, I don't, I don't see a scenario where the team moves up from 16. Yeah, I'm right maybe, there with maybe you. a couple slots, maybe one or two. Right. But not inside the top 10. Yeah. But like we even saw like with the Saints last year, right? When the Saints traded up with us, they went and got Chris Olave. Everyone was berating us. Oh, Chris Olave, you passed on him. You guys are idiots. Who's this guy who's a second round grade? Come to, then we get Sam Howell, Cole Turner with that trading back. Obviously, it opened up a lot of doors for us. So that's why I'm kind of, I'm, I'm calming down about trading up because you'd have to give away those depth pieces. And this team is not in the position to give away depth pieces. We need as many as possible. We saw what happened at linebacker. We saw what happened at corner. Thank goodness guys like Danny Johnson stepped up and really showed out in Wild Goose. They did a really good job. And obviously, Benjamin St. Juice coming into his own. But you're going to need those kinds of development pieces, and you need that in the draft. And that's why I don't, I don't look into moving up. If there was a legitimate quarterback that you were excited about, I would say, yeah, probably. But the reason being is that there's probably maybe one first-round grade on a quarterback here, and there's no reason to trade up for a second-round grade in this draft class, unfortunately. Just my opinion. Yeah, no, no it's uh, it's one of those things, too, where we've done such a good job drafting in the mid to late rounds over yes. the last few years with Ron Rivera and them that you kind of just want to keep those picks because you know that those guys are going to be solid contributors. And we have we need so much depth on the O-line, corner, linebacker, like you said. I, I mean, there's you can go on and on about where, where we need some depth pieces. So I, I, I don't like it. But I hey, if they did it and it was for a franchise guy that they really loved, I'd be like, all right, but I just don't see it. I think they're going to write yeah. it out. The same and one thing I will say is I keep hearing a lot of people, not you guys, I hear I keep hearing a lot of people talk about we need a reshuffling the offensive line. I know I said it myself. The reason I was pissed off at the time, okay, I knew that we weren't going to make the playoffs. And it, I was very angry. The fact is, <laughs> is that the offensive line has to stay healthy. You can have the best offensive line in history, but if they're not on the field, it doesn't do you any good. And so I feel like a lot of we're talking about reshuffling the offensive line. We got to remember they got to stay healthy. And I feel like that's objective number one is it, we have pieces here. We just have to be able to get them on the field together and working. And uh, that's probably the biggest cog in the machine. But without a doubt, so we need to be um, adding guys into the draft, of course. Sorry, Hall. No, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the scenario, more more likely scenario would be they trade back a couple spots, acquire yeah. some more picks. Um, like you said, we've had success hitting on guys in the third round, fourth round, or later. Yeah, you have. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah. Kyle, I mean, like you said, look back at last year. They <laughs> they acquired those guys, and they turned out to work out and highly in our favor. Hopefully, Cole, Cole Turner can get on the field a little bit more this year, stay healthier, and make some plays for us, but – yeah, just adding more picks. I'm always about adding more picks. Like you said, it adds more depth, more chances to hit on guys in later rounds, more guys on rookie contracts or are, uh, yeah, rookie contracts that you can add more depth pieces or add more veterans, add more free agency free agency guys, or even pay your guys whenever the, the time comes. So, uh, yeah, definitely uh, I would be a proponent of trading back as opposed to trading up anywhere into – Maybe it's a couple spots here or there or in the top ten. Yeah, and like I've said so many times, the only the only time you should be trading up for a quarterback is if you could guarantee or trading for a quarterback, if you could guarantee that they're going to do well with not much going on around them. Because if you do trade for them, they don't do all that great, they're going to need that help around them, and, and you just trade away all those assets for them. And so that, Unless that situation arises, I don't see it. 
coming to. But Steve, this next question from the Colonel. How much is the ownership change affecting the commander's ability to coordinate a draft strategy, especially without an offensive coordinator to gauge whether we are going after a veteran mentor or a rookie quarterback? Reed, turn up your microphone. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, I, I think it affects it a little bit. Uh, with the, I don't know about draft strategy. Well, <laughs> if we knew in the past, you know, Dan would run yeah. off his boat from the sideline and make mm -hmm. the draft pick. But yep. I think since Ron's took over, he's kind of stepped out of that light a little bit. I don't know if it necessarily is affecting the draft strategy because those guys are on, you know, bend wages. So we know what they're going to make. It might be affecting some of the free agent signings per se, because, you know, you got to figure out who is it? Is it Montez? Is it Cam? You know, they're right. both coming up on their final, final year of their deals. And Will they want to extend any of those guys and pay them the big bucks? I, I don't know if I'm sure in the old days, Dan would have a hundred percent say and and where it is right now. I, I'm, I would be guessing they would probably not want to make any giant or splash signings until they get that figured out. And with the offensive coordinator, I don't, I don't think it's affecting. Well, no, I do think it's affecting the offensive coordinator search because there might be a perception that some people would feel that this could maybe be a lame duck year per se, or just with the future unknown, uh, Ron, technically some people see him on the hot seat. Not sure. So I think it's definitely affecting the offensive coordinator search. Yeah. I, I don't think that it, it affects the draft strategy at all because you, you hear a lot of times like, well, teams will fire a scouting uh, staff like right before the draft and they still use their strategy. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's why I'm looking at this. I think Steve is absolutely right about the free agency and the contracts and all that. And that's why I believe that Snyder is not going to sell 100%. I feel like he's going to have a minority stake because then he actually has a vested interest in what happens in the future. So then you can transition everything over. And that way, the new ownership isn't liable for all the lawsuits against Snyder. You could keep Snyder on board. He has to deal with those as well. The new owner doesn't have to deal with as much. As much as the fan base would cry about it, it's a smart way of going about business for ownership. That being said, I don't think it affects anything with the draft strategy. I feel like they're going in, and they, I, I hate the lame duck thing. I, re, I really don't – I can't stand that line of thinking because, to me, the NFC is wide open. Anybody can see that. The only the team – the one team that's in the Super Bowl, we went into their house and we beat them on primetime football. Like, the NFC is wide open. If we're going to talk about lame duck, I feel like this is, we, this is the time we need to be pressing the gas to be perfectly honest with you and just rolling with what we got. Cause I feel like with what we got, I think we could do it. And, uh, but we'll see how they Thank do you it. for making my argument for Derek Carr. Cause you got to put all your chips in now. It's wide open. We need a, a superstar quarterback. I told you, I didn't care. <laughs> I didn't, I don't want to trade for Derek Carr. If we sign Derek Carr through free agency, I'm all for it. That makes was, a lot of sense. I was completely off the board for a veteran quarterback until a certain, somebody tweeted out that they did that. It's the, that happened that they were going to jump shit from the team. And I'm like, let's get a veteran quarterback, you know, let's get Mark Tyler out of here. I'm just... <laughs> but you know, you know, he, um, he DM me to, uh, to meet up with him to, to answer our, our fight? issues together. Yeah, basically he was like, what's your problem with me, man? I was like, dude, I don't have an issue with you. You know what I'm saying? I just, he was like, well, next even issue come to me directly. I was, I thought that's what I was doing by quote tweeting. Like yeah. I thought that's what <laughs> subtweeting was. That's yeah, why I quote tweeted it. Also it's the internet. Yeah, I don't know, man. It, <laughs> we're we're all over the place on this show, so cut me some slack, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's go to our next fan question, and we're going to have to go to our Discord chat server for this. This one's from Tim Towner. Steve, thoughts on the NFL putting together a minor league built-up of players signed to practice squad slash future contracts, financed by the league with league players from the league, expand from 16 up to 20 players, and you should have enough for like 12 teams. Fans would be invested to watch players associated with the team. The teams can send coaches to get experience with new roles. And these players would get real game experience, which apparently stops in their cur cur current role with scout team reps. I actually like 100% that. on board. I've been on, on board with a farm system type yeah. organization for the NFL for years. The NCAA to me is a corrupt POS. I just think it's, it's not about producing football players, but that's the only feeder league we have right now. And to me, that's going to be the XFL when it comes on board and they're going to see that there's with the rock and his, his group in charge of that league. I really think the XFL is going to take off. And I hope that that can be the minor leagues of football where, where teams can just pluck, you know, send people up, send people down. I got a rehab assignment, come back down. So, you know, give my, give my shout out now to the defenders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my man, it. DC They're going to do it baby. this year, but yes, I'm fully on board with the farm system. I think it should be more than just the NCAA. There has to be something better. And I hope the XFL can be that. There's also another league starting up too. I think, um, 
AFL or something, another league starting back up. So USFL, USFL, there you go. Yeah. But I think the XFL from a money perspective will be the yeah. most marketable and that's what the NFL cares about. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. I get this um, standpoint because obviously college only goes so much and then you're not eligible anymore. So what happens to the players once they get to the NFL, they're not on a team, they're recycled essentially. And this would open up the door for them to get more game film to allow other coaches. I love this idea. I do think it's probably more important for the NBA. I've always said this. I've said this for a while. I felt like the NBA was uh, destroyed from the inside with their one-year rule with the NCAA. Uh, players were not progressing. They were not being productive once they got to the NBA. It felt like they were just coming to get paid. And uh, that's not the way the NFL is right now. It just generally does seem there is a good system in place where these guys are coming into the NFL ready to work. I mean, we've seen guys like Justin Jefferson do it, right? So I feel like the NFL pro it would benefit the NFL if they're looking along the lines of going to that one-and-done. Because the one and done, I feel like, is going to corrode things. You have to be able to supplement that with some productivity. What about you, Reed? Yeah, hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Like Hall, you got anything else? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I just think that – do I think they will ever have, like, a farm system? It would be smart because the amount of injuries that happen to players, it would be smart to have, like, a – I mean, I don't know how they would work it also because I guess you could pick from, like – all the XFL teams, all 32 teams can pick from every XFL team or USFL team, whatever you want to call it. But I feel like they're already kind of trending towards that now just because you see, look at a guy like uh, the kick return guy for uh, the Cowboys. I forget Turpin. his name off the top of my Turpin. head. Turpin. Yeah, Turpin. but the he's a guy that, from uh, the – He uh, the punt for us, yeah. That yeah, exactly. He's the guy that's from the USFL or something like that. So guy right there. I definitely yeah. think that uh, P.J. Washington played in the XFL, was like frying stuff, frying in the XFL, so – Taylor I definitely Heineke. think that Taylor Heineke, yeah, yeah, Heineke, exactly. So, I definitely think that uh, it's not like a, a farm system per se, but they're definitely watching the guys that are playing in those oh, yeah. other like little minor leagues. And I think that over time, the more and more, the more and more talent that gets infused into the XFL, USFL, more and more guys that kind of just fall out of the NFL. Like a guy like Ruben Foster, get another shot. Maybe he he puts on uh, enough on tape. He gets another shot in the NFL, so I think it'll be uh, that kind of system. Yeah, Josh Gordon gets his 12th shot. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely hysterical. No, it's a really good idea, and I think yeah. that it's probably better for the NFL because a lot of capable players out there that aren't on teams because of how many, how much money they're allowed, how many roster spots, this would really help out and be able to – because game film is so – valuable for coaches being able to go back through it's timeless you go back time and time again and be able to evaluate and that's why the senior bowl is very important so the extra film without a doubt tim is such a great question this next one from tim steve is kind of a long one is the qb paradigm shifting in the past teams look for quarterbacks with arm strength and more recently overall skills like mobility and rushing but after seeing multiple teams trade up for kids that now appear to be bust has the brock purdy experience changed the qb landscape no, I don't think it has that. I, I still think that's the exception, not the rule. I mean, people don't, you're not going to see these resurgence of, you know, fifth and sixth round picks and seventh round picks become QB ones. I still think it's about, it's all about the skill. I, I think it's trending to answer his question with a different statement is it's trending to where I think the new age of quarterback is someone who's very mobile and not as much of a gunslinger like we've seen in the past, because as a rookie, when you're learning a system to me, I think having mobility is one easy way to learn a system. You can't you first read, second read, run, and eventually you'll pick it up. So I think that's the paradigm shift we're seeing. I don't think we're seeing a, we're going to find Brock Purdy's every year, just like Tom Brady was a sixth round pick. I think it's the exception, not the rule. Yeah, I don't think the paradigm shifting. I just feel like it's been two quarterback eh, draft classes is the reason why people are kind of chilling on them when Caleb Williams comes up you'll see the like the craziness resurge itself um essentially but I do feel like Brock Purdy taught everyone a lesson essentially in saying that it, it's not about the quarterback and what they can do it's more about the team that they're being put on and you saw you remember when J the Jimmy Garoppolo gif went crazy and everyone was saying that uh, Jimmy Garoppolo was calling Kyle Shanahan's plays terrible he said an f word you remember that yeah, yeah. So what basically what was happening was Kyle Shanahan had to come up with a new game plan for Trey Lance at quarterback, and they were dreadful. It was horrible. And so that's why they had to go back the other way, and Brock Purdy did really well with that. And so I feel like coaches are now realizing, yeah, you might have the arm strength. Yeah, you have the mobility. You have the body of Cam Newton. You can run over guys. But can you break down and get the offense running? And I feel like that's where the issue is. So it's more so of building up your team and adding a quarterback in here who's not – 
the engine, but is a cog of the engine uh, more so is kind of how I'm looking at it, where you shouldn't be building your entire team around the quarterback. Your quarterback should be a cog in it that you're just inserting and is actually just running with everything else like Brock Purdy. That's just how I look at it. also, yeah, I mean, quarterbacks will never be devalued. They're just too important. Right. It's the most important position in sports. Uh, it's a copycat league. The teams that are always in the playoffs are always going to the Super Bowl, the teams with the good quarterback. So it's – and those guys all have traits. Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, those guys all have very, very elite, specific traits. And it's a copycat league. I think you're going to still see people – anytime anybody has – look at Anthony Richardson this year. The whole reason that he's yeah. going in the first round – his tape is not first round. He's made some incredible plays. But other than those few plays every game – a couple plays every game, there's nothing really there, but because he has these traits, some coaches think they can coach it out of him. So you, you get people in the mid round to late round every year or every couple of years that come in and end up starting games and doing all right. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. I, I don't think that it's going to necessarily change anything. Yeah, you right. know, Hall, anything to add? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you just look at the teams and the, uh, in the playoff hunt or that made the playoffs this year, majority of them are first round picks like Mahomes, like the AFC, Trevor Lawrence, you know, Lam- uh, Lamar Burrow. Jackson, yeah, you got the outliers like Brock Purdy, who, again, everyone's talking about Brock Purdy this, Brock Purdy that. He was not even, like, the plan. He just happened to get on the field because of injury. So, And then the the real plan was first-round pick, Trey Lance. So, I mean, you got guys like Dak Prescott, obviously, like I said, Brock Purdy due to uh, injury. Uh, Jalen Hurts was a second-round pick. Yeah. So, I mean, you might hit every once in a while on, like, a later-round guy, but at the end of the day yeah, – you do. <laughs> at the end of the day, there's always a first round pick more than likely that's gonna he's not married yet. Hit hit your franchise and turn your franchise around and get you to where you want to be. So I don't think it's gonna really shift. The only thing that might shift about it is the guys that go in the later rounds have like way less money than the first round picks, obviously. So they could build the team out a little bit more. But again, if teams aren't going into draft situations like that. I'm going to skip the first round talent. I'm going to look for that fourth or fifth round guy to like, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that's just not how it really works. So there's always going to be guys that are overdrafted. There's always going to be the first round quarterbacks that are overdrafted or that are going to hit and change your franchise around. Yeah. I also, it, oh, it, it seems like it used to be like once every like 10, 15 years, you'd get this quarterback prospect that comes wrong. Right. Right. Yeah. Like Andrew Luck, Peyton Manning. Now it's like, Three out of the last four years, I mean, you got Caleb Williams coming up next year. You got Trevor Lawrence the year before that, Joe Burrow the year before that. And it's like these guys, the game has changed so much that in high school, it's kind of like with wide receivers. They start running routes early. Quarterbacks are throwing the ball so much more in high school that their that is ability to read defenses and, and call plays and stuff is so much more advanced than it used to be. So these guys are a lot further along than they were in years past. Because remember, they used to have to sit for two, three years before they right. would have to even come into a game. I was going to say another reason why you're you're always going to see teams reach for that first rounder right. is because of that fifth year option. Like yeah. you have them at yeah. a discounted year. Like when Baltimore did it to Lamar, they jump back into the first round, pick him at 32. Genius move. So I mm-hmm. think you're always going to you're going to continue to see these teams just take a gamble. Like, well, we at least we could have him for a fifth year if it, if it right. hits. If not, then you know whatever. Yeah, and hopefully I think the paradigm is going to be with teams trading up for quarterbacks at this point. I think it's going to be much more of a sure thing uh, from here on out. But this last question that we have from the Discord chat server, Steve, this is from Andy Lockhart in the UK. Oi! Thank you, Andy. Appreciate you, brother. He asks, do we re-sign AG this offseason to an extension or risk it and wait till after next season to try and keep him? Or do we let him walk in free agency? In my opinion, no, you don't sign him right now. You can look at signing him next year, but depending how we're sitting at that time, which I think we're going to pretty be pretty strapped for cash because you're going to have to make some bigger decisions than Antonio Gibson that you probably want to let him test the market. I think you might be able to find a replacement for him in the draft somewhere. I think yeah. that if you can kind of um, eliminate money in the future with AG because the running back position is not one that is coveted. Highly, right? So it's it's not like a bunch of money is going out to running backs anymore. So you can look at it from the perspective of the agent of the running back and the team saying we have mutual interest in getting a, an extension done because I don't want to go out and test that market that probably won't be fruitful. So let me get this extension where it could bring down the money a lot. And that way you can ensure that AG will be here for multiple years, but it doesn't backbreak you. It doesn't take you away from anybody else. It just helps him out and it helps you out a little bit along those lines. I feel like that something that could happen. I'm not sure if it's a pressing need to be perfectly honest, Andy, because it doesn't really make sense with how much AG is getting paid. You'd much rather just let it ride out. Um, 
like Steve said, where you have like guys like Isaiah Pacheco, seventh round pick coming in, being very productive for the Chiefs. So that's something that can always happen. Khalil Herbert is another guy who came and did really well for the Bears. So it's not something you really want to pay too much money into, but I would understand why AG and the team, if they did sign an extension this offseason, I would understand why. Right. Especially when you already when you when you have somebody who you know is going to be your lead back like Brian Robinson. I mean, it's right. just kind of the nature of the position too. I mean, running backs don't last long. They're a dime a dozen. It seems like every year you see people coming out that produce like you talked about Kyle that are back. So unfortunately, we're going to have bigger options like you talked about Steve. We're going to have more people that we got to sign. We're going to have a lot of money invested going other places. So I do think AG is probably not going to get re-signed when his contract's up. But who knows? You know, hey, yep. he could. Go for two two K yards. You know? And now this last question we have is from Ty Mac. <laughs> I don't think it was for the show, to be perfectly honest with you. But what I want to ask this question. DMs? Um no, his question was how much college football do you three consume? He said, I watch Oklahoma and a little else. Do you wait to see who the top prospects are, then look at film? He says you guys are very knowledgeable. Oh, uh, thank you, man. Yeah, all through the season, I always follow that. Like I'm already looking at 2024 just because like i'm weird about the nfl draft i'm kind of like autistic when it comes to and i feel like i don't know maybe i don't know like love <laughs> on the spectrum i watched that so i think i might be um i do have a little bit of michael in me but um i, I think <laughs> i think that uh <clears throat> it, it's one of those things where if, as long as you keep up with it it's interesting to see the players shift throughout the season like uh, two years ago when Zach Wilson was coming up, like you slowly saw him rise and all of a sudden everybody talks about that one, this one throw made him the mm -hmm. second overall pick. No, he was the second overall pick before that he was doing so good. And it was just, it took him a little bit, but once he got there, it was interesting to see, but uh, it's also fun to see him fall. But yeah, I kind of just pay attention <laughs> to the prospect. I don't have a college team, so I just kind of pay attention to all these players and watch games all, all the time. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not like Reed. I don't watch throughout the season. I'm, I'm more paid attention to the commanders. And then once the off season comes, that's when I'm looking at the prospects. But what I'll do is I'll just go to like Google. Obviously I'll just type in the bro uh, prospect breakdown and rankings and i'll find the biggest one that has the most on there and i'll start watching the the top prospects based on the positions that i want to watch but then if i come across a popcorn pos prospect like i told you guys before it's a prospect where you could just pull up some popcorn play and you'll you'll see the talent on the film you don't have to look for anything um and i'll stop it i won't look in any more games i'll then go to later round prospects at that position and try to use the comparison there and that's how I'll use the back end going towards the front end of the first rounds to kind of gauge where the where these guys talents are because I feel like a lot of times there's like agents in like manipulating these types of things where guys are getting ranked and stuff like that so also you use always see eyes. the media's the media and apparently like the NFL like scouts and stuff it's interesting to see like during the draft where they fought and like how right they were about right. some of these guys. Like remember Malik Willis, there was rumors he was going to go second last year to the Lions right. for a little bit. It's like that. No, no or how, or how much scouts. a pro day can have someone's status. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's, it's crazy, dude. Yeah. That's, you see that every, just one good 40 time. All of a sudden people are going to, I wonder who's going to fly up this year, you know? Yeah. But that's Probably just how Kyle. I look at it. It's kind of a weird yeah. way to, to go about things, but there's only a couple popcorn prospects in this draft. Yeah. I've, um, B, obviously, we talked about B. John Robinson before, um, and I haven't watched him yet. I know what it's going to be like when I watch him, but um, mm. it's going to be crazy to see where he winds up because I feel like he could go to Tampa, just somewhere that needs it. But if Philly were to get their hands on him, I'd be pissed. Stop. Don't. I'd be don't pissed. Even, don't. Look, that tell me that wouldn't be the right fit. Tell me it, it would. It, no, it would be. I know. So don't say uh, that. Don't give them any ideas. Okay. It might happen, dude. They have but, 20, uh, 20 unrestricted free agents. They got some holes to fill coming up. Yeah. This season. And that's yeah. why the one yeah. guy that I highlighted with Isaac Sameo, uh, the guard, starting guard for them, the right guard, is going to be hitting the market. And obviously, overthecap.com has him projected at five and a half million. So maybe it's probably going to be more than that, obviously, coming off a Super Bowl roster. But it doesn't look like they'll be able to retain him. And that's somebody at 20 nine years old that you know you could plug right in it's going to give you starter ability he played 15 games this season so he's got the consistency the stability that you want and it wouldn't be crazy expensive like more like seven million i think that's Plus, probably all right after next year they got to resign jalen hurts they don't have that fifth year option with them yeah that's true so absolutely true all right everybody that's going to wrap us up for this episode can't thank you guys enough for joining us steve as always, brother. Um, but before we get out of here, if you just wanted to plug your social media handles and your podcast, just in case anybody watching has a followed you yet would like to. 
Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, you can follow us at Twitter at uh, at command underscore this um, on YouTube. Uh, command this podcast you can find us anywhere all your facebook uh twitter uh, social media next week we got our awards uh, annual awards episode coming up we're calling oh, it the moxies yeah. we're well, gonna give we away go. the moxies mm-hmm. uh so <laughs> that should be a fun little episode so thank you for uh for having me i appreciate it of course i'll yeah, make sure to yeah. tune in for that one yep. i was listening I'm to your show the, the other night yeah i was listening to your show the other night while playing video games that made me laugh it's very funny yeah. all right everybody <laughs> that's gonna wrap us up for this episode i'm kyle i'm Hall, and i'm michael and we'll see you guys again (laughs) on thursday have a great safe week we'll see you guys and hopefully we get some good news coming up here soon Uh, maybe some leaks about eric b who knows we'll we'll find out very soon all right everybody we'll see you on thursday be safe washington football hey what's up everybody it's kyle i just wanted to say thank you so much for watching and if you liked what you saw make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell that way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel Also, we just launched TheBurgundyZone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Peace!